Thank you very much, everyone, for, for coming tonight, and uh, also to the familiar faces in the audience and my colleagues, so <laughs> this is great. So yeah, very much appreciate it. Um, so uh, during the lecture, I don't mind if you ask questions, um, raise your hand, or just speak out. And if my voice, I tend to have a quieter voice, if it drops off a little bit low, just ask me to speak up and just prompt me. So. <clears throat> So today I'm happy to talk about last contributions to monitoring Earth's energy balance from space, and I, I hope you um, enjoy hearing about this subject. Um, I'm going to be talking about at energy balance, um, introducing it uh, at, within the atmosphere, at the top of the atmosphere and at the surface. Uh, we want to talk about how much energy arrives at Earth. Uh, this will be talking mainly about uh, last contributions to monitoring solar radiance. Uh, some some uh, data from the source mission and then talking about the oncoming future TESIS mission. And we'll also discuss solar forcing of climate. Then I'll discuss how much energy leaves Earth. Um, this is where the uh, new uh, last contributions toward the NASA Clario Pathfinder mission come into play. This will be, my discussion will be not quite as much detail in Clario as Peter Pluski covered about a year ago in a public lecture then. So if some of you were at that public lecture, I'll be covering it in a slightly different way, mainly focusing more on understanding why those measurement requirements for the Clario Pathfinder mission are what they are, and um, giving an example as a shortwave cloud radiative forcing of climate. <clears throat> and if time allows, I'll talk about some other sort of data analysis um, uh, research that we've been working on as well. So I like to begin these sort of talks with um, just the basic, what is weather, what is climate? <laughs> so as we know, um, weather, you go outside, you experience it. It's instantaneous conditions. Uh, climate is the average of weather. When you wake up in the morning and they say that the average daily temperature might be um, 17 Fahrenheit. You might only be at that average for about 30 seconds, but those were the difference there. We're talking climate is uh, broad uh, spatial scales and longer time ranges. Uh, weather is more instant. Um, there's also the term climate change. Um, that's when I say climate change, I'll be talking about long-term changes in weather patterns. So these are these average conditions, and when I then I'm talking decades to millions of years. But as most everyone here, I'm sure, will know that in there's another connotation of climate change in the in the context of environmental policy, which then in that context tends to mean a refer to a change in modern climate um, induced either directly or indirectly by humans. So ho hopefully it's clear when I use these terms uh, from the context of the talk what I'm referring to. So. <clears throat> can't give a energy budget talk without talking about the energy budget and showing one of these pictures. Um, there are many uh, different versions of this highly informative and very detailed figure that might be scaring you because of all of the numbers. <laughs> but we're going to simplify it and discuss it in pieces and get some very interesting insight from it. And what's being shown here is uh, global averages of, um, say I don't have a pointer, does my cursor work? This uh, on, the on the your left hand side is the incoming solar radiation and on the right hand side is the outgoing radiation. So when we talk about being in balance, we're talking about our, is the total outgoing equal to the total incoming? And again, just to remind you, we're talking long time periods and over the whole Earth because at any particular region, or short time scales, we're always out of balance. That's our more um, daily state is to be out of balance. And it's actually those imbalances that drive our weather patterns, the average of which becomes our climate. So um, let's see. So what I wanted to do next is talk about um, maintaining balance. And beginning up on the upper left, I'm going to start putting in some percentiles to ha help um, go from some of these very detailed numbers in here to something maybe that you'll have an easier time to grasp. So 
for all practical purposes, this is not entirely true, but to several significant digits, we get all of our energy from the sun. So it's, you cannot understand climate without knowing what you have coming in. So I'm going to put that number 100%. Yes? What are your units? Oh, these are watts per square meter. So it's the anet joule. 300 per watts per square meter. I thought it was more like. Uh, you did very good. You've been to some of these lectures before. That's the global average. So if you've been to some of the last public lectures talking about source mission, or um, they'll talk about the top of atmosphere, or the, the uh, total solar radiance, and it's around 1361. So that, that's that, when you have that number, it's in intercepting an Earth at the disk, but Earth, um, its globe is a factor of four less because we are a sphere. So taking that 1360 divided by four, um, let me okay. go back here, then you can see that number up there is 340.2. So that's, that's where those numbers come. So all of these are global averages. And that's taking kind of sort of an instantaneous um, irradiance change to what we call a forcing. Yeah. So great question, I was gonna come to that later, but you took my thunder for another slide, so that's wonderful, that's great. <laughs> so. Yeah, so uh, I'm going to put down there 100% coming from the sun. And what we see right away is that reflected, immediately leaving the Earth, no longer available for interactions with our climate, 29% leaves. That's Earth's albedo, roughly 30%. Um, interesting, though, is that clouds here, they essentially um, uh, double that value. Without clouds, our Earth albedo would be 15%. So clouds have a dominant role in reflecting that shortwave radiation right back out to space. And so that means that 71% of the sun's energy is available for interacting within the atmosphere and at our surface. And you can see here that prefer preferentially, most of the incoming solar energy is absorbed at the surface. 48% to the surface versus 23% in the atmosphere. So you might be wondering at this point, well, if all of this solar energy is coming in and it's preferentially absorbing here at the surface, um, our temperature rises, but why doesn't it just continually rise? Why don't we have a runaway temperature scenario? And that's because there's, you can think about it in the sense that we have also, um, sorry, here I go one more step, we have um, radiative cooling. So not only does matter in our atmosphere and at the surface absorb and scatter radiation, it also emits in the long wave. So you can think of this somewhat like a sink where you're turning the faucet on, energy is coming in, but you've got the plug open at the same time. Energy is also leaving. So your sink isn't overflowing. So this is a kind of an analogy to consider about um, uh, surface temperature, why we don't have a runaway greenhouse effect, uh, things like this. So that radiative cooling that occurs is, uh, occurs at a rate of temperature to the fourth power. So let's take a look now. And if we, if we wanna look, for example, where, let's concentrate at the surface here. We know that 48% of the sun's energy is absorbed there, and if we're going to be in balance, we're actually also in balance at, at layers at the surface and in the atmosphere and at the top. So can we balance that 48% number? Well, <clears throat> we do know that approximately 26% of the energy um, at the surface is, um, leaves by evaporation. So primarily from the tropical oceans, heating of the tropical oceans, evaporation, we've got that loss of energy there emitted. We also have convective heating, a smaller portion there. This is, this is when I'm talking if a air comes in contact with a warm surface, the air gets that warmth from that warmer surface. And then we also have this 15% that um, just is terrestrial heating. But what's interesting about that 15%, and I hope I haven't obscured the numbers too much, this is, this is a balance, this 15% is a balance of two very large terms. Uh, total outgoing um, 
heat from the surface versus heat from emitted back from the atmosphere back to the surface. We've got this residual 15% there. And what's interesting here as well is that the, and I think I'm going to go to the next, yes, here, now I'm going to, I'm going to start going to move up in the atmosphere here. So now I've kind of gone from surface energy budget to the title says now atmosphere energy budget. These two, t these, uh, excuse me, these three terms on the right hand side essentially balance this term here. So we, we're still roughly in balance by what we're seeing. Um, as we, um, if we now think about the atmosphere, of course, what we know originally is that we have 23% of the incoming solar is absorbed by atmosphere, uh, sorry, mo molecules and gases um, in the atmosphere. And, um, sorry, my, sorry, excuse me. My animations are a little slow, so I'm talking too fast for my animations. And so I wanted to establish here that there's um, energy that is absorbed is admitted at another wavelength. And so we've got that 23%. What we want to see now is can we get, if we're going to remain in balance, can we get a total of 71% energy now leaving the system? So in our um, sensible heating, our, our uh, convective, the air that was against the warm surface uh, ultimately rises, transfers that heat higher into the atmosphere. The energy that had been uh, lost at the surface due to evaporation can then be gained by the atmosphere when that evaporated, uh, when there's another phase change from gas back to liquid. You get an energy release in the atmosphere. And we also know from our terrestrial heating here that 15%, Roughly 5% of that leaves through uh, what they call an atmospheric window. It's a, it's a region in the spectral space that doesn't absorb at those infrared wavelengths. So that, that energy is just free to leave. And the remaining 10% um, um, stays, within, stays within the atmosphere. So when we look num at these numbers, we actually have um, a total of, it should, if I've done my math right, it should be about 66% here. Add that 5% that ultimately left, and we have maintained balance. We've conserved energy and maintained balance. So, <clears throat> that's what that number there, 71%. So, all is good. Now, the thing is, is that while we're well, I've tried to convince you that we're in balance. We're, we're not exactly at balance. And this is, so let's now talk about the imbalance. And what I wanted to, two things I wanted to establish here is first, how it's measured and what the value is. At the top of the atmosphere, I've, I've put some text up there. Um, LASP has a long history of measuring this incoming solar energy uh, source. I didn't mention Takati, but that's another um, mission that measures total irradiance. And then TSIS is going to be the next mission to go on, be a follow-on to source. And on the, on the other side here, we've got some other instrumentation um, that are measuring both the reflected shortwave energy and the emitted long wave energy at the top of the atmosphere. And Ceres is a Earth radiation budget mission that um, operationally monitors uh, these features. Now if you look, now I've removed my percentile so you can see back at my numbers again. I'm gonna make you look at these numbers here. <laughs> these, um, this balance here is essentially, does this number here equal the sum of this one and this one? And it, it doesn't. It slightly is out of balance by 0.6 watts per square meter. And what I wanted to really focus your attention to is just to emphasize that that imbalance is a small number differenced essentially from much larger numbers. 
of which the uncertainties in those larger numbers um, dominate even the magnitude of that imbalance. So that's important to consider. Go ahead. But the uncertainty in the imbalance is smaller than the uncertainties in these numbers. Right. So, so you get that imbalance in a different way. Yeah, yeah. So they, the, uh, there's a, let me, so the first thought is, is that with this, with these particular instrumentations that are currently measuring, um, with the exception here, if you look at these values and their uncertainties, we're not measuring that imbalance, we're constraining it. And we're, we're actually, the, the biggest source of that constraint comes from a network of surface monitors, um, these Argo floats in the ocean, and um, some land and ice measurements. What, what they have found, um, these have been very beneficial, is they're be measuring um, surface temperature and then heat content, and gosh, I think it might even go down to uh, 2,000 meters below the surface of the ocean. It is, it's, you know, pretty robust layer of the ocean. Um, despite while I'm saying that the accuracies of these top of atmosphere Earth radiation budget instruments don't have the um, accuracy to monitor that imbalance, they have precision. And what they found is that the precision of the series instrument is good enough that it's tracking the same fluctuations in ocean heat content measured at the surface. So they're taking that as an added constraint. But it is an important point that um, the, uh, one, one of the, you could, there's a number, I'm trying to think what would be the best reference for you to read more on, probably even this Stevens et al. paper, you could Google Kevin Trenberth here at NCAR, um, different researchers in the local area and internationally that, that, um, that study these radiation budgets. And I should mention that there's different versions of this chart with slightly different numbers and a particular scientist might spend their entire career working on one of those, one of those values. So, um, what I wanted to say, oh, go ahead. What's the clear sky emission to surface? It looks like a large... Yeah, so I was just coming to that next. So, so what this chart, when you really start looking at it, more and more things pop out at you, and you're like, what is that? Why is that? Um, the biggest thing I wanted to show here is that um, I think a, a very good way to think about what is commonly called the greenhouse effect is just understanding that the Earth's surface gets energy from two sources, the sun and the atmosphere. Energy that's emitted from in this atmospheric layer is emitted in all directions, some of it directed back to Earth. So that is those, some of those atmospheric layer terms. That is your greenhouse effect. And what I find really quite remarkable about that is I mentioned early on the talk about how, how strongly clouds modulated the outgoing reflected shortwave. Of the amount of the greenhouse effect, so now in the, in the long wave part, clouds are maybe 15% contribution to the greenhouse effect. So it's predominantly molecular gases, radiative active gases in the atmosphere, such as carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor. So that's the that's the kicker there. So if you're thinking about a greenhouse effect and you're thinking about it trying to like a lid on the atmosphere or a trap or something like that, just think to yourself, ah, that's just simply the energy that the Earth's surface is getting from the atmosphere. So it's actually a good thing because it's a lot of energy. I should just go back to the previous plot so you can see the numbers. So this is roughly 66%. I might have my about 60% of the total incoming energy from the sun. So we're also also receiving in the greenhouse effect. So if we didn't have, if we didn't have our atmosphere, the, the surface temperature, our, we wouldn't be here. It'd be cold. <laughs> be really, not not a fun sort of environment. So, um, okay. So the crux of my talk then is how do we 
how do we then look at missions to measure that imbalance, to really measure the imbalance at the accuracies needed to monitor small changes in that number over a long time, okay? And that's, that's where I'm gonna be talking about TSIS and Clario on the right. And uh, this, uh, this is a cover of a, of a paper from 2013 that discussed the Clario mission and they used these calipers with the earth inside and I thought it was such a, such a fun um, graphic. It just really brings to mind that you're really measuring something very precisely. So Clario is a high accuracy, long time stable mission to measure Earth's outgoing energy. And so I stole that idea and I put the sun <laughs> in the calipers. And, but uh, there's, uh, in terms of last, there's nothing new here. I mean, we've been making these sort of precision measurements of the sun for a very, very long time. Um, uh, we got URs, timed, source, SDO, minx, uh, gozar, um, thesis into the future. So, so uh, the, we've got the corner on the market, if you will, on nailing that sun's energy. But as I'm gonna show you, we still have work to do. So next part is gonna be uh, thesis here. Uh, so building up to that, I just wanted to show you the, this is the um, observational record of total solar radiance. So the total energy coming in from the sun on the different instruments native scales. Um, <clears throat> this is a tracer of a sunspot number here at the bottom. And uh, LASP, um, Source, and Takati missions are actually carrying the, the um, climate data record of total solar radiance right now. They're, they're the ones making this observation, and TSIS will continue into the future. And through really excellent um, world-class facilities here at LASP for calibration, a number of these um, instrument records have been um, diagnosed with a scattered light problem. Their values were too high, so they were able to come here and calibrate, um, you know, witness instruments, witness versions of their instruments, and see how much scattered light they were affected by. And their measurement records have been lowered down to about this 1360 watts per square meter. Now, one of the other really important things about um, building a, a long-term record of uh, solar radiance is the overlapping in time of all these um, individual instrument records. You can see these offsets here. They overlap in time. They can essentially be scaled relative to each other and you can build up something like this, which is a long-term record of what we think the sun has done, how its total radiance output has changed over since 1978, essentially. So, and there was my, my number here, I was to remind myself about the 340 watts per square meter. If you're wondering how we got from 1360 to 340, which was on those Earth energy balance charts, this is simply dividing by a factor of four. Um, <clears throat> they call the TSI, the, these modern um, TSI observations um, by the source TIM and Takati TIM instruments that were built here at last, the gold standard. Um, really achieved quite phenomenal, like really phenomenal engineering advances. Like just 20 years ago, we didn't know this number to even 3%, and now we know it to 0.03%, and even better with TSIS. I'll show you what that's going to be. Um, LASP has also had major contributions to monitoring the spectrum of the sun's energy. And uh, I don't show it here, but uh, some uh, UV wavelengths have been measured for practically as long as the total solar radiance. Uh, what, what's shown here, this is what a solar spectrum would look like before it interacts with Earth's atmosphere. This is at the top of the atmosphere, um, long word, if you can imagine, I'm gonna put my finger right here. This whole thing, by the way, is if you integrate it up, it's about 96% of the total solar radius. Where, so this is a large chunk of what the total energy is, but how it looks in the spectrum. Um, prior to the launch of Source, we hadn't measured the sun spectrum from space any longer of this line. 
So this is all new information that we had um, since source. Uh, the other th great thing that um, SOURCE has provided uh, with these long, great measurements of solar radiance is ways to um, improve models of solar variability. Um, we have an understanding now of how the irradiance changes, and we also have an understanding of what changes in the sun to induce that irradiance change, and it's related to some um, variability in, in magnetic activity in the sun um, and I, I won't go in into that but we are able to link those and with the um, with the source data I'll show for example here how we're able to use the source data as validation of these models now what you're seeing here is as the sun rotates we're we're having a change in radiance this is the total solar radiance ultraviolet ultraviolet visible and near infrared and the magnetic, the magnetic variations in the flux in the uh, sun uh, that change this irradiance, um, we can visibly see, or with a telescope, uh, solar telescope, things uh, such that are manifestations of this changes in magnetic variability, such as sunspots and bright features. So they alter the distribution of energy coming from the sun. And so when the sun rotates around, it's, it's essentially like kind of sweeping out a spotlight of these, um, these spots and bright features, you know, so as it's rotating, what's directed towards Earth varies with the rotation, but I'll show you in the next slide that the sun also varies um, on different time scales. So <coughs> what you then saw here was about two solar rotations. You saw the, the uh, what's most apparent are these sunspots, of course, and you could see dips in the TSI, and um, at some of the other um, spectral bands, our agreement isn't so good. Um, and so that's one of the key features that we'll be getting from TSIS is higher accuracy observations in the spectrum of the sun to validate these models. And of course, a really important thing with these models is um, taking these uh, estimates of the sun's energy back to times when we didn't have measurements or also in parts of the spectrum that we haven't measured yet. So this is what I mentioned that the sun also varies um, not just on a rotation time scale, but over roughly something in about 11 years, and they call that the solar cycle. Um, <clears throat> in the purple, you're seeing source observations, and the green is the model from the previous slide that I was talking about. So you can see that we were able to validate that model behavior with the source observations. And these spiky things you see, that's not noise, that's, that's uh, dips in irradiance from the sunspots. But you can also see that you have a kind of a sinusoidal increase, and that's because um, there's also bright patches on the sun that outweigh these uh, dips in the sunspots. So they, it has in phase with the solar activity and you get more sunspots in the sun, you actually get more bright features as well. And the total um, net effect of those is to increase the sun's energy. <coughs> um, we, of course, also have um, 14 years of uh, spectral observations. And what I wanted to say is why you, your eye might be drawn to differences, like you're seeing differences in the traces between the model in green and, and the measurements in purple. Please take a look at the right-hand axis. So that is, we're talking relative variabilities here of fractions of a percent. And that's beyond the ability um, of, of the uh, uh, source instrumentation to measure this spectrum. So we're not able to validate the long-term um, trend in the model. So this is going to be a key key thing that comes out of TSIS will be um, accuracy such that um, um, even over 10, 11, 12 years that we're able to maintain that accuracy and, and um, evaluate whether our understanding of the physical variability in the sun is correct. So how will TSIS do that? <clears throat> so I guess this maybe how and how much. <laughs> 
So it's really going to be a story in the next few slides of calibration and verification that's done here at LASP. It's really world class. Um, in terms of TSI, um, uh, the TSIS um, mission coming up here and I'm just launching in a few weeks will be measuring to about 100 parts per million accuracy compared to about 300 parts per million for source. So really phenomenal and very highly stable. So the uh, spectral irradiance, um, we're going to be measuring with TSIS to 0.2% uncertainty. That's about an order of magnitude improvement. And the stabi stabilities are going to be, uh, well, 0.05 to 0.01% uh, per year. So we'll be learning a lot more about the sun in the next years to come. And uh, oh yeah, I mentioned here, just in case uh, anyone was curious, I'm a scientist, I don't get to touch the instrument. <laughs> so <laughs> that's as close as I got to be <laughs> when it was all uh, packaged here, ready, um, before we sent it off to the Kennedy Space Center. We all got to go down by the high bay and stand one by one in front of the window and have our picture taken. And so, so I'm like, yay, yeah. <laughs> this is great, it's one for the scrapbook. This is the instrument here that measures the total energy, the TIM instrument, and this is the one that measures the spectrally dispersed energy here, SIM. Um, and I'll, I'll have some more pictures of that coming up. So, so here I say, how will TSIS bring the calipers to the sun? Um, this is fun to talk about too. Um, and, and if you too, if you go on one of these tours that Brian was mentioning, and they're not using these labs, you can go in and see these facilities, and they're, they're really remarkable. But um, there is a, as I mentioned, there's a calibration and verification <coughs> approach. The uh, um, what, what I mean by that is that all of the elements in the instrument at the component level, unit level, they're all calibrated. So when we uh, talk about making a measurement, you can imagine, you know, you have to know voltages here and temperatures here. When you piece this all together, we verify it at the very end, to, at the very end of the instrument level against a, a standard. And these are NIST traceable, what we call cryogenic radiometers. And uh, we've proven that we can, we've essentially proven that we've calibrated these instruments so well and verified their calibration in these facilities that uh, we have demonstrated reaching the accuracies that I showed you on the previous slide. So 0.02% absolute accuracy across the spectrum of the sun and uh, 100, uh, yeah, 0.01% um, in the total. So really phenomenal. And then this was another fun photo I just wanted to throw in here because I was in Bern, Switzerland recently. I don't know if any of you have been there, but you can go in their Old Town area and they have this wall and there's these different things stuck onto the wall. Well, these are length standards back in the medieval days. <laughs> so I wanted to throw it up there just to show how far we've come. You know? <laughs> so we now, um, the standard meter, like SI traceable standard meter, I think they know it to nine decimal places in air and maybe 25 in vacuum or something. So uh, the variation that you see in these standards in the medieval times, we, we don't have that issue anymore. <laughs> so yeah, so this is just a picture slide of um, of uh, some of these world-class calibration facilities I've been talking about. Um, these facilities just, if I hadn't mentioned, I don't think I did, um, the source instrumentation was launched prior to the building of these facilities. So we didn't, we didn't have these calibration capabilities back when we launched source. But we do now. TESA's instruments have been calibrated in these. Um, it's fun when you, funner when you go in person. Uh, this is the cryogenic radiometer that evaluates end-to-end. -end. Um, how we've done, the, there's sort of a tent back here. Um, the instruments are um, calibrated at um, vacuum and at the in, uh, um, irradiance levels of the sun. So they're as much as close to flight-like as we could. And in terms of the spectrum, if you look on the right-hand side, it's relatively the same. Here is the 
the Tisa Sim instrument. Here's the cryogenic radiometer. But because we're measuring the spectrum, we have to somehow be able to calibrate across here instead of just the total. So we have this um, very fancy um, laser system set up. And what this graphic here on the lower left is just showing you need quite a few lasers. They're highly stabilized. And then calibrations are done you know, step by step across the wavelength bands. And uh, so this, um, this is an older one, but it's this movie that I think is uh, really nice. It's just an engineering mock-up of a movie. But um, what you're going to be seeing is, is when TESIS is on the International Space Station here in what I put 32 days, but who's counting, um, how its daily operations are going to be like. Um, it's an operational mission. That means that it's every day we're going to be providing data, um, roughly 15 orbits a day as the, well, I just missed it there, the, we've got the eclipse side of the orbit as the sun rises, the instrumentation will find the sun, track it through the sky until it goes back into orbit eclipse. And I'll, I'll mention some more things. I'm going to play the movie again uh, just to kind of talk through it here. So here we're zooming in on the instrument. You can see it's kind of got this arm thing here. I'll mention that here in a bit. There's the TIV instrument and the SIM. There's kind of this green cone of light and a purple cone of light. Those are just um, representing um, sort of the field of view that's uh, glint free. So we want to make sure we're not getting any glint from the, the bright metal structures on the International Space Station itself. And that's actually part really why there's that uh, arm that's lifting the instruments up higher than, um, than the International Space Station. It's basically getting clearance. And that arm can can then move. It can actually stow those instruments away. And we have to do that if the astronauts go out to do a, some repairs or <laughs> tour around outside the space station. We actually have to stow our instruments. So there could be some disruptions to the, probably not an entire day's record, but during this, you know, being on some platform like the International Space Station has, has a, challenges there as well. So, um, This one is another movie that I thought was fun. What you're going to be seeing is just a, a simulation of the TESIS instruments acquiring uh, the sun and it's going to be simulated by a green laser light. So you'll, you'll see how it tracks here in real life. Oh, sorry, I pressed the wrong button. Here we go. So it's, it's speeded up, so you're going to see people moving really, really fast in the background. Um, you can see up there, there's a, uh, it's captured that green light beam, it, that laser is moving, the instrument's following very smoothly with it. Um, this is, these are LASP um, uh, engineering facilities here. Uh, I was going to show a movie as well from uh, at Kennedy Space Center where the instruments went through, um, were shipped to there and then they're getting packaged and ready for launch on the SpaceX Dragon. Um, uh, but anyways, the movie I think was too large and so my computer kept crashing so I had to not show it. But uh, um, this is a big monumental day and if you could look, you could actually see the engineers' faces underneath their masks. They would all be smiling very, very wide because they passed everything. Um, so this was the 19th of October. Um, after many, 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 many years of hard work and even years prior to that of proposal activities and trying to convince uh, government funding agencies that we need to do this. <laughs> uh, so it's been a long, long time going. Um, this is uh, just a, a photo here of a, a SpaceX um, um, carrier and the robotic arm. And uh, you could also Google, if you Googled um, SpaceX and robotic arm, you can actually find videos of them taking things out of the trunk of the dragon and 
putting them on the International Space Station. Again, for some reason, it just wouldn't work on my computer, so. All right, so we're actually about two-thirds of the way through my talk, and I haven't even talked about Clario yet, but I think it's a good time to just kind of pause and reset and just kind of digest some of the stuff I've been talking about in terms of climate forcing. So now taking that thesis information I talked about and thinking back to that energy budget diagrams. So the forcing is any destabilizing influence that alters how much energy enters or leaves the climate system. It can be natural or man-made. So for example, the sun is the forcing, uh, volcanoes are forcing, and so is uh, fossil fuel emissions. Literally any one of those, and there's others as well, any one of those can alter how much energy um, is in the Earth climate system. So then these forcings can also trigger complex feedback effects that can either intensify or weaken the forcings. So as I mentioned, the sun is a forcing, and can we observe Earth climate response to the sun's forcing? And the answer is yes, we can. Um, the, in the stratosphere, higher up you are in the Earth's atmosphere, the atmospheric response to the sun's forcing is, is more easy to detect. Um, and here in the stratosphere, what we're looking at here is uh, pressure, latitude, and the contour bars are temperature, and the gray shadings are up to two Kelvin, so two degree change in temperature. So if you looked at solar maximum years and subtract, just taking a, a compilation of solar maximum years and then differencing from solar minimum years, so you're getting that solar cycle change, you actually see up to a two Kelvin uh, change in the, in the stratosphere. And we actually, can also see a small surface response to solar cycle forcing and surface temperature. Um, this plot here takes a little bit more explanation. And the very top is a composite of surface temperatures. And um, in these other panels are four different uh, forcings that can alter Earth's surface temperature. Uh, and so volcanoes, solar radiance, and humans. And this plot goes from 1885 up to 2005. And what you can do is a statistical decomposition and say, okay, well, those temperature changes had to be the essentially the sum of these effects. Uh, so from this sort of analysis, you can find that at the surface, on a century time scale, so back say 1900 to 2000. 0.05 degrees centigrade change in surface temperature, which is um, much smaller than the 0.6 degree change that's uh, uh, felt to be due to human activity. So this rise in the Earth's surface temperature was roughly only 8% due to the sun, uh, dominated by human influence. We also have climate sensitivity. Climate sensitivity is, uh, well, it looks like a very, very simple equation, but there's a lot of physics boiled down <laughs> into that. Um, it's, it's essentially saying, how much does Earth's surface temperature chain, change relative to a change in radiative forcing? And this lambda parameter here has a, got a lot of, um, a lot of uh, how best to put it, a lot of physics in it and a lot of uncertainty in that. Um, clouds and clouds feedbacks being the dominant source of uncertainty in that climate feedback. This is where a nice segue to the Clario mission. So the Clario mission, that Earth reflected part, is really looking to produce highly accurate climate records that are sensitive to radiative forcings, climate responses, and feedbacks. So essentially looking at this parameter, trying to measure small changes in that. So <clears throat> I showed this picture before. This was the cover of a journal article. And uh, just real brief, the Clario uh, mission is, they call it climate change metrology. Metrology meaning measure something very, very accurately. Uh, so we're measuring that imbalance very accurately. What it does is it requires what we call a change in strategy and a change in um, 
me how measurement requirements are defined. What I mean by that is uh, the current suite of, uh, of um, Earth observations that we're making are really uh, providing us a lot of information on how um, process, like it says, what I call process effects in the atmosphere. So for example, how does cloud reflectance change with its optical thickness or its particle size? Um, so in some of these process studies get down to smaller and smaller finer spatial scales. So we really want to validate our physical understanding of how these processes affect Earth's climate. Um, the Clario mission, so at the very beginning, this is the broad spatial scales, long time ranges. So we're not looking to nail down further information about processes. We're trying to measure the sum effect of that changing slowly over time. So that means it puts a very natural floor on measurement requirements. How do we measure that? Well, we have natural variability in our system, so we want to measure better than what the natural variability is to detect a small change. So um, getting one of my other examples here I wanted to show, uh, since we understand that clouds are such a, uh, such a uh, um, source of uncertainty in our climate, our current climate, and how uh, clouds may change in our, to changes in our climate, that's highly uncertain. So we could take a uh, sort of very simple back of the envelope calculation along with some satellite data and um, I think we can convince ourselves of the accuracies required to measure small changes in that and compare that to what the Clario mission is proposing to measure. So. Let's assume that cloud fraction is sensitive to surface temperatures. This is my little thought study here. It seems that, I mean, the inverse is very clear. You could be outside on a sunny day and a cloud passes over and you feel a little bit cooler. Well, you can kind of turn it around and say, okay, well, if our, if our um, surface temperature is warming in a warming climate, could that affect our cloud fraction? Well, sure it could. You know, one plausible scenario would be um, increased evaporation from the surface, so it provides more water vapor to the atmosphere, could make more clouds. So it seems plausible. Um, if we wanted to look at what a change in net radiation, and we often use this 4 watts per square meter, which is, correlates with the doubling of carbon dioxide, um, could we offset a doubling of CO2 in our environment by just increasing the fraction of clouds? In our, in our coverage, so cloudy sky fraction. Um, we know our incoming radiation very well. Um, we also know, what I didn't show you this calculation, but we can compute what the albedo of just the cloudy portion of our current global average skies are, and that's 37%. And a very simple calculation would show you that you only need to increase cloud fraction by 8% to offset a doubling of CO2. And when you look at just the, you know, just look at the huge variation of clouds in our natural environment, it sounds totally possible. So what are we worried about? So let's take a look at what a decade worth of satellite data shows us. So on the left is shortwave flux anomaly. So um, down here is uh, warming, up there is cooling. And on the right is cloud fraction and percent going from minus three to plus three. Again, as uh, cloud fraction decreases, we have less clouds to reflect away, so we've got a warming situation and opposite up there. The two traces on there are two operational Earth observing missions. One is Ceres, I mentioned before, it's the Earth Radiation Budget Mission, and the other one is called MODIS. It's a operational um, mission of, one of the things which it does is monitor clouds. So what we can see, and these I hadn't mentioned, but these are monthly averages between kind of in a band around the equator, 30 south to 30 north. And um, they've had their seasonal signal removed so that that portion of the natural variability has been taken out. And what you can see is that we don't have anything near 8%. <laughs> also, we we have, if you were to imagine with your eye, um, taking this from a monthly average and then just 
doing a yearly average across here, you would see that these are small changes. If you're talking global and annually average, our reflected energy um, changes smaller than half a watt per square meter. And the variability of cloud cover is less than 1%. And that's startling. When you think about that previous slide with all that, pictures of the clouds and the huge variability, if you essentially, if you went year after year and you did a global and a yearly average, that pattern of cloud cover would look almost the same year after year after year after year. So on a regional and short time scale basis, uh, our clouds are just so dynamic. But on global and annual averages, their spatial pattern is, is very consistent. So if we're trying to measure a trend in something that's already a very, very small signal over time, this is why these Clario measurement requirements are like 0.3% per year. So really phenomenal, but we can think about, we can go back to these problems and we can do back of the envelope calculations and look at satellite data, and then we can begin to understand why these accuracies are required to actually measure that imbalance. Um, series and VIRS are, um, are going to be the, uh, VIRS is the follow-on to MODIS, and uh, the Clario Pathfinder will be, um, let me tell you in the next slide here, I didn't mention, but uh, Clario and Clario Pathfinder, Clario was a full mission. It, it passed mission concept review a number of years ago, but it was put back to uh, something called a pre-formulation stage because of budgetary concerns. Um, but in 2016, they approved a smaller version of it called Clario Pathfinder. And uh, one of its key science goals is to take that really high accuracy that mission is going to be capable of and transferring it to other on-orbit sensors being series and VIRS. So current sensors that are up there operating right now the Clario Pathfinder is going to come along, and I'll show you on the next slide. It's going to be able to transfer on orbit its high accuracy to these other on orbit operational sensors that have maybe an order of magnitude worse accuracy. So, thereby, we're going to end up improving our current record um, by tracing back accuracy from Clario Pathfinder to these other ones. So, really, quite phenomenal. And where LAST comes in is they are building their reflected solar um, instrument for the Clario Pathfinder mission. So I'm getting close to the end of my talk. Um, the Clario Pathfinder reflected solar instrument has its heritage from other work done here at LAST called the Hyperspectral Imager for Climate Science that was developed under a NASA instrument incubator program IIP uh, with, by Greg Kopp here at LAS. And um, the data cube up there on the upper left, I'll be showing you that in just a couple slides. But that's an example of the, the uh, uh, very high density information that's going to come back from the uh, Clario reflected solar instrument. And what's really neat about this instrument, or what's different, than others on orbit is that the whole instrument package, not talking mirrors, anything like that, the whole instrument package can be pointed to other places. So that really um, is, is a big part of what allowed engineering to achieve these accuracies. When you don't have mirrors and you don't have polarization sensitivities, uh, you can achieve higher accuracy. So, um, this is an example as uh, Clario is going through its orbit. If one of these other on-orbit satellites, um, as they pass near enough, the Clario Pathfinder instrument is going to um, uh, be turned, if I'm going to just use the word turned, so that it, at the same space and angle and same time, it's going to be looking at the same reflected radiation that this other or uh, operational sensor is. So very critical to have both time, space, and angle matching to transfer these high accuracy calibrations.
Clario will also be on the International Space Station. And you can kind of see here in the graphic um, that they'll be kind of located top and bottom of each other. I need a little bit of a drink here. And then I'll talk a little bit about DataCube. Um, I might um, call it quits at this slide instead of going into the data analysis part just because it's taking me a little longer and I don't want to take up too much of your time. So I think I'll, after I explain this slide, we'll, we'll end there. It's always, data cubes are fun to look at, but they take some explanation. <laughs> so um, on the right is an uh, engineering graphic of the Clario Pathfinder instrument, and you can kind of see the flight direction arrow is pointed. And you can see how the slit of the instrument projected here towards the Earth, and it's acquiring a spectrum. This is going from 400 to almost 2,300 nanometers. So essentially, a large portion of that um, <coughs> solar energy. And, um, and then we've got uh, spatial direction. So basically, when you think of a cube, you then have wavelength and x and y spatial direction. So that's what makes the cube. Um, you can stack these acquisitions together to, to build this up. And so that's why it's superimposed on top. They have a um, uh, red, it's kind of a, uh, they created a, uh, an image, if you will, of what it would look like from your eye if you're looking down from the Clario instrument at that spot in the ground where it was scanning across. And it's just a, this is a cartoon graphic. Um, that point um, doesn't exactly correspond with the, with the RGB image that was shown on there. But what's important to say is that in the wavelength, you see some structures in here. These are um, absorptions by radiatively active gases in the atmosphere. So we've got water vapor primarily as the strongest absorptions, but we've also got oxygen absorption in there and others. So you're getting a lot of information of the spectral interactions of the solar radiation with radiatively active gases in our atmosphere. We also will get information on clouds, we get information on the underlying surface. Um, and uh, then very, it, it, you know, there's different ways to think about these data cubes. Um, for example, um, how they differ from other current instruments on orbit right now where you might only have a handful of discrete bands, but uh, in, um, you still have the same goal, is you wanna take this information and physically relate it to processes, um, sources within Earth's atmosphere and at its surface that affect our climate. So that's the, that's the end goal of the Clario mission. Um, the, what we call a hyperspectral or a continuous Spectral information obviously gives you more than a handful of discrete bands. Um, why that's important is that um, even if you selected your best five wavelengths to make a measurement, they're not unique to one climate relevant source. So you could, uh, you could pick any point in that spectrum and say, well, I want to know about clouds. But you also have to know about the surface, or you have to know about water vapor, things like this. If you have more information in the spectrum, you have better ability to more uniquely separate uh, these climate relevant sources. So that's where that added information content high density comes in with these data cubes. And um, I won't talk about some analysis approaches to, to simplify or quicken the uh, ability to take large and large amounts of data like this and synthesize it down into some information that we can actually uh, use to predict how our Earth's climate is responding um, to changes. Um, and uh, that would be just the <coughs> subject of another talk. So anyway, so I thank you for your attention. Um, reassuring to know that the variations in solar output that 
don't contribute much to climate variation. But what if the sun uh, went through some unexpected gyrations? Let's say uh, you had a 10% increase in uh, solar output for 20 years. Uh, I mean, so that would be, that? yeah, that would be so a big. What, what, what sort of magnitude of climate change would that be? Right. Well, that. Well, I could give you a number, but it's a highly controversial number. So I mentioned that um, one of the models, the solar radiance models I had showed in, in an earlier slide that said that we were able to validate it in current time, um, particularly in its total energy. How these models work is they take proxies of of that magnetic variability on the sun. And we actually have information of sunspots observations way back to almost 3,000 years. Um, but since the dawn of the telescope anyway, so near the beginning of 1600 when the scientific revolution began, we really have been getting good observations of these spots on the sun. So using information like that, and understanding in our current environment how irradiance maps to these proxies, we can then take them back in time, obviously with much higher uncertainty. Um, proxies is only one way to do that. Um, there are other methods, and they're giving different estimates back in time. The people talk a lot about this a period in the mid. Uh, 1600s called the Maunder Minimum, which is a period when the sun was very, very quiescent. They didn't hardly see a single spot over, you know, years, you know, maybe, maybe eight spots in a year versus several hundred. And this went on for, gosh, I want to say it was like 70, 80 years or something. So they, they would really like to better constrain um, or understand what was the sun's total energy output back in a time like the Maunder Minimum relative to today. And the particular model that I mentioned here in this talk, that would be um, a solar forcing of, of about um, a tenth of a watt per square meter, which is almost about half, uh, excuse me, about, uh, no, it's about three times so today's min to max solar cycle variability is, a, is a roughly three times smaller than that tenth of a watt per uh, point. Actually, I should say here, I've confused, let me back up a bit because I'm confusing between solar forcing and a radiance change. I'm going to talk in a radiance change units just so I don't confuse my, and the, the difference is that factor of four uh, for global average that I talked about. Um, so our best estimates right now, if we talk in a radiance change, it's 0.6 watts per square meter that the Maunder minimum had. And the irradiance change from a min to max of the solar cycle is um, about a third of that in our current. So even though that 0.6 watt per square meter is small, it's still much larger than when we're currently ex um, in experiencing in our modern climate. Um, but then there's other ways to estimate back to that modern minimum time and some of them, some of those other methods are giving almost no change in the sun's output even though it didn't have this uh, magnetic cycle activity apparent on it and others are having um, order of magnitude higher than so very large change. So I think the jury's still out on that. Um, so, There's but, no way to go back to that same historical period from uh, fossils or plants to see whether the Yes, no, exactly. So that, that is one of the things that they do. Um, this magnetic variability on the sun, um, it, it has uh, uh, what they, and it's not a field that is uh, fully understood yet, but there's uh, parts of that magnetic variability that stayed anchored in the sun, and parts that actually gets blown out with a solar wind. And it really uh, then um, ends up, there's a record of that open uh, contribution in uh, isotopes in Earth's records. So plants, trees, um, you know, all these different isotopes. So people have also 
use these isotope records to try and go back in time. And uh, the, there's uh, challenges with that. It's not, this isotope records aren't my field, but I do know that uh, they have to involve models at some point because uh, to understand how those isotopes enter and stay within the Earth, you also have to know things like what is our carbon cycle, and you have to model some other features. So their, their results are also uncertain. Um, but uh, some of the more recent ones that I've seen are, are um, well, one was just slightly more than that 0.6 watts per square meter that I quoted. I think they came up with 0.9. Um, but there is a range of uh, estimates, and um, but um, yeah, Question. number of different. Yeah. Well, I want to ask you about not this particular measurement. I mean, you're talking about reflected radiation. Mm -hmm. Well, now you're only looking at one particular direction, but I, yeah. two pi star radians. It's reflected in two pi star radians, right? So I, uh, I I missed something here, and I now I'm realizing why I should have talked continued talking about my data analysis point. So the uh, point the. Uh, the uh, Clario um, measurement required accuracy is 0.3% in reflectance, which is the uh, radiance being normalized by the incoming. And they're going to know that incoming through an instrument like TSIS soon. So, so they're basically going to have uh, concurrent uh, information of the incoming irradiance hemispherically, you know, so basically at the top of the atmosphere. And then your reflectance is the is that pencil beam of radiation coming out normalized by that. So you can think about it if our global reflectance, the Earth's reflectance or albedo is roughly 30%, we're looking to measure 0.3% um, um, changes in that over a decade. So 0.03% per year. So small changes in that um, um, albedo contribution. Maybe we'll take like one more okay. quickish one, and then uh, we can ask questions as we're kind of filing sure. out and okay. sorting things out. Yeah. Is there any advantage in putting the instruments on the ISS rather than just uh, free orbiting in their own orbit? No. No. Um, cost. Is, is this cost. Cost. Yeah. The. Uh, <laughs> that that would be yeah advantage cost. There we go. <laughs> it wasn't the. Um, you know, sometimes you're just dealt the hand that you're dealt, and um, and then you make the best of it. And, and and before, actually, when the shuttle was going to the International Space Station, it was terribly dirty environment. I mean, it was pretty hard on instrumentation. Um, with with those uh, shuttle sort of transports uh, no longer going on, it's a much cleaner environment. And uh, there are a lot of trade studies went on in terms of the thesis work that I'm familiar with that assessed, you know, how, how much obstruction are we going to get from the International Space Station structure itself, and it, it's kind of this living, breathing organization with all of its motions, and you've got to be able to damp that so you can stay focused at the sun, and they, they did a quite detailed uh, trade studies, and I think they can do, you know, good enough to make these measurements. Um, the, there will be follow-ons to TSIS, you know, because the monitoring the um, incoming solar is so important for a climate. We, we actually can't study our climate without knowing that, that um, NASA, you know, contributes resources to keep these measurements going. Um, and those, those next version of those mes measurements aren't, no one's going out searching for an International Space Station to make them, you know, like to, to keep them going. So they, they might actually be their, more, their own orbiter. But uh, yeah, um, we don't get the instruments back. But, so can't, can't calibrate afterwards. They, I guess that's an, uh, enormously expensive. And uh, yeah, they just, that's not going to happen. So that would have been a plus, too. Everyone got excited. But so in terms of the spectrum, things like uh, um, just being able to get those optics back and, and recalibrate them in the lab would be hugely beneficial. But nah. <laughs> said no, can't do, so. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah.